Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service here today at Grace Church Loughborough. A very special welcome to you all. It's good to be with you again, and a welcome to you if you are here with us for the first time, if you're visiting with us today. We're going to be spending some time together uh, as a church. We're going to be worshipping God. We're going to be listening to a few songs. We're going to be studying the Bible, and we're going to be offering up prayers. And we're going to start with that now. Let's offer a word of prayer to God as we start our service today. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are our creator and you are our sustainer and our provider, but that also you are our friend and our saviour, Lord, and we are truly blessed to know you. We thank you that we can gather here today as a body uh, of your church and that we can worship you and we can spend this time together. And I pray that you would guide us in our worship, Lord that you would help us to focus on you, not to be distracted by the things that are around us, but to remember that this time now is yours. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lift our hearts to you, to remember who you are, why we're here, that you alone are worthy of our praise, Lord. I pray that you will bless our time, that you would speak to us through the reading of your word, the Bible, that you would speak to us through the songs that we are going to listen to, that you would speak to us through prayers and that you would speak to us also, and perhaps especially so through what Paul has to bring us in his, his sermon today. Be with us now, I, I ask. Um, open our hearts, open our minds to you and help us now to, to focus on you over the next hour or so. In your name I pray. Amen. So we're going to start with a song now. Uh, this is one that many of you will know. Uh, Only a Holy God by City of Light. A reminder, a great reminder of um, who God is and why we should worship him here today. The chorus reads, come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. <laughs> 
been thinking quite a lot over the last week about how we worship as a church when we're apart and the challenges that that brings. And I mean worship in the sense of how we direct our praise to God when we assemble together. I don't, I don't mean worship um, in the sense of how we enact our lives on a daily basis, in the sense we should always be living lives of worship, but specifically with what we do when we come together and we direct our voices and our hearts to God in praise. So worship in this sense is essentially the activity of glorifying God in his presence with our voices and our hearts. It's a, a conscious adoration of him that we express when we come together. Um, the purpose of our lives, um, as you will know, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So our worship as a church is a direct expression of this. Um, Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Lord, word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Ephesians 5.19 says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, um, a slightly longer passage, starting at verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. God's design for his people throughout history has always been for them to assemble together, to worship. Old Testament Israelites assembled together as a nation, a complete nation at festivals throughout the year. Jesus started to then build the church as we know it during his time on earth and we learn about the the early church don't we in, in in the book of acts but old testament prophets also spoke of there one day being a great assembly not just of israel but of all nations so god's purpose has clearly always been for us to gather together with the express purpose sorry of worshiping him and at the moment it's obviously very difficult to use our voices to do that to raise our voices in song we can sing along if we wish but maybe the focus needs to be more on how we can use our hearts in worship hopefully everything that's included in the online service produced each week points to god and draws attention to him and not ourselves and causes us all to think on him and reflect on him and praise him in our worship, we should be delighting in God. The scripture readings, the songs we hear, the prayers we offer should all cause us to have joy in the knowledge that we have a God who loves us and provides for us. They should remind us that we are now at peace with him. They should remind us that despite our sinful natures, despite the fact that we are incapable of living a perfect life, we have a saviour who rescued us. They should cause us to delight in God. It also, also should cause God to delight in us. As we love him and praise him, we are bringing joy and delight to his heart too. Um, it's a bit like when, when we love somebody, we enjoy pleasing them, don't we? And even better when that is then reciprocated to us as well. And our relationship with God works in a very similar way. We delight in him and he delights in us. We can draw near to God in our worship. If you see Hebrews 12 again, verse 23 says, You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. We might not see him with our eyes at the moment, but we are worshipping in the presence of a holy God. And that knowledge should shape the way we worship. God is there and God is real and God is listening. If you look at Hebrews 12, 28, it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. 
God will minister to us through all of this. We might consider the sermon to be the focal point of our learning, but God can speak to us through uh, the reading of his word, um, the Bible, as we sing songs to him or just follow the words along on the screen, as we listen to the prayers, as uh, maybe we pray ourselves as well. Worshipping here in the comfort of our own homes is never going to be as beneficial and rewarding as it is when we can gather together as a whole church. And God knows that. But at the same time, gathering together as a whole church is never going to be as beneficial and rewarding as worship will be when we actually do that in God's presence, when we see him one day and we get to spend eternity with him in heaven. So there's always going to be a case of having to do the best with what we've got. And all it requires really is a joyful attitude, a focus away from the distractions of everyday life, a willingness to allow God to draw us into his presence and a desire to offer our hearts, if not our voices, to in, in praise to him. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And we can do that here. We can do that now from the comfort of our own homes. Even though we can't be together, we can still worship him with our hearts, even if we can't express to him that praise and that adoration in the same way that we normally would when we meet together as a church.
Bibles, we're going to uh, read our passage today from the Gospel of John. As you know, we've been working through John's Gospel over the last few weeks, and we're now up to chapter 7. Uh, so we're going to be starting at verse 1 of chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles with you, it would be great if you can uh, follow along as I read these verses. So John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marvelled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority speaks, so seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And we'll look forward to hearing what Paul has to bring us on that passage shortly. Before he does that, uh, we're going to have another song. Uh, but before that, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer together now again. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the riches that it contains within it and for what it reveals to us and for what we can learn. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to read it freely and study it freely together. And I pray that you would open it up to us today and that you would help us to learn more of you and to learn more how to love you uh, and how to live for you better as a result, Lord. Thank you that we are able to gather here today and worship. Thank you that we have the freedom to do that. We are very fortunate and we are very blessed, Lord. Help us not to forget that. Thank you for that opportunity that we have. Lord, I want to offer up today before you those who are struggling at the moment. Maybe people are feeling lonely, maybe people are having issues with their health, maybe there are issues with the family or work or money. There are various things that people can be anxious about Lord and I just pray that you would remind them that you are in control, that they have nothing to worry about Lord because you have a plan for each and every one of us and that we have so much to look forward to when we can uh, have that time spent with you in heaven in eternity, Lord. This life is a mere drop in the ocean, and it doesn't always feel easy. Um, but Lord, help us to look to you and to fix our eyes on you as our friend, uh, as somebody who loves us and cares for us and will always provide for us. Lord, help us to be able to support one another in these circumstances. It's a bit difficult at the moment sometimes when we have to be socially distanced. But Lord, I just pray that you would help us to find ways of being able to support one another and love one another more at this time. 
I pray that maybe uh, we would return to normality soon. Lord, we don't want to be silly. We don't want to be unwise. Um, and, and we don't want to be doing it before the time is right. But Lord, we do want to be able to meet together as a church. And we want to be able to do that soon. So that I, I, I pray that you would um, make that happen, Lord, so that we can enjoy being together as a church family, spending that time together again. Help us to grow as a church, Lord. Help us to be bold in spreading the gospel and speaking your word to our friends and our family, Lord. We want to see Grace Church grow. We want to see it become a bigger part of the community and we want to see your work grow and your church grow, Lord. And I pray that we can be a part of that and that you would help us to, to be bold and uh, have the, the confidence and strength to see that happen, Lord. Lord, I pray now for the rest of this service. I pray for Paul as he brings your word to us, that you would give him the words to say um, that would speak to us all and that we would all come away having learned more of you today. And of course, we pray for the children. Thank you for them and the blessing that they are to us, Lord. And I pray for their time now in Sunday school. Thank you for the work that continues to go on with that. And I pray that you would speak to the children today. Make our hearts receptive today to what you have to teach us, I pray. In your name. Amen. Right, we have one more song now to listen to, and then I'm going to hand straight over to Paul. 
Well, good morning and thank you, Richard, for leading our time of worship together. We are continuing this series in John's Gospel. As you know, we're working our way through John's Gospel, uh, or at least through uh, a substantial chunk of John's Gospel. Um, and the, the aim of this series really is to look at um, how do we grow to Christian maturity? What, what, what are the characteristics of a mature Christian? Uh, and, and what do we learn here about Christian maturity? Uh, we've uh, entitled this entire series Legendary. How do we live a, a legendary Christian life? Uh, and of course, we've already explained this, but we're defining a legendary Christian life as one which is devoted to the Lord, one which pursues uh, his pattern uh, and his purpose for our lives, uh, that being the highest calling that we can ever have to follow the call of God on our own lives. That legendary life being living the kind of Christian life that turns the world right side up uh, as we see uh, in uh, the in in, in acts uh, that that statement about the early Christians and, and so we're looking at these passages not necessarily to draw out every single aspect of them every single truth that is in there but really to learn what does it mean to grow to maturity as the Lord's people now, as we come to this passage today in this first part of John uh, chapter 7, um, it is a confusing passage uh, as you read it, and certainly if you read it at uh, sort of uh, a first glance, at face value, uh, it can appear a little bit strange as though the kind of things are bouncing around a little bit. Uh, it's not very clear what's going on. Uh, Jesus' brothers encourage Jesus to go to the feast. He says he's not going, but then he does go. Uh, he says it's not his time uh, yet but then he goes to the temple and starts teaching and it, 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 we could look at this passage and find it quite confusing and quite contradictory um, and I think part of the problem here is that the English uh, obscures a little bit um, what is going on here and, and, and what is meant I think the English isn't quite at this point as clear as uh, the original language was, just due to the fact that uh, we have uh, single words in English that may be translated uh, um, uh, back into different words in the original languages, which each had subtly different nuances uh, that we lose in the translation. Um, uh, this passage, as I say at, a, at first glance, could appear to be about uh, when uh, or, or indeed whether Jesus should go up to this particular feast, the Feast of Booths. Um, now, if we look at this passage in that way, we will misunderstand what's going on here. Um, that was a part of the discussion. Uh, I'm not suggesting uh, that that was not uh, in the mix, but it wasn't the whole of this discussion. Discussion. And in fact, uh, I don't believe it was even the major part of this discussion. I think what we're seeing here is about when Jesus would be revealed, when Jesus would be glorified, when Jesus would be crucified, and about not running ahead of God's plan, uh, about not letting events carry Jesus along, but rather uh, keeping things uh, in line with God's will. And I think that's the real purpose um, of this passage. And I'll explain why I think that as we go through uh, the passage. But I think as we come to this, it would be helpful probably for us just to uh, remind ourselves a little bit of, a, of an overview of the timeline. Not lots and lots of detail, but a little bit of an overview of the timeline um, that brings us to this point and brings us to um, this discussion. Uh, but, but before we do that, I'd like to just remind you of what it says in verse 5. Uh, and I think, again, this is one of the, uh, one of the main things to understand, uh, certainly to understand that first part of the passage is that at this stage, uh, Jesus' brothers uh, don't believe in him. I, I think that what that means is that they don't see who he is and they don't believe that he is God incarnate. They don't believe that he's Messiah. And I don't think it's intended to convey that, um, that they didn't believe the miracles, they didn't believe the signs. Um, that would seem to me to be contradictory to what they say um, uh, in, in, in the conversation. But I do think uh, that it's important that we know that as yet his brothers don't have an understanding of who he is and therefore of what his actual mission is. 
So let's just remind ourselves what's gone on as we came out of chapter one, that great chapter where we have that prologue, uh, and you know my temptation to get into that, so I'm not going to. Uh, but uh, we, we first of all in chapter two come to uh, that wedding in Cana where Jesus uh, turns the water into wine. And John describes that as the first of the signs that Jesus um, performed. And then, of course, following on from that, uh, in verses 13 through 25 of chapter 2, we saw Jesus going to Jerusalem for the Passover. And we saw that occasion where Jesus cleansed the temple, the first of two occasions, actually, where Jesus cleanses the temple. One at the beginning of his ministry uh, and then another at the end of his ministry. Uh, but we see Jesus cleansing the temple. And, of course, the response to that is, uh, what gives you the right, Jesus? By, by what? authority is the phraseology that they use uh, in the scriptures by what authority but what right do you have Jesus um, to, to, to do this to behave in this way and of course uh, Jesus gives them uh, the sign they ask for a sign and Jesus says the sign that will be given uh, is that they'll destroy the temple and uh, he will rebuild it in three days of course not referring to uh, the physical temple but referring to his body, as John narrates for us. Uh, and then we see Jesus in chapter 3 withdrawing into the countryside. He, 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 he leaves Jerusalem, uh, stays in the broad area, he stays in Judea, um, but nonetheless he goes out into the countryside where he's not quite so much under uh, the scrutiny, the close inspection of the religious leaders, uh, because he knows it's not yet his time. And Jesus, uh, well, in fact, Jesus' disciples start baptizing. Uh, we have that account where John uh, the Baptist recognizes and exalts the Lord Jesus. And we're told that Jesus, although he didn't baptize, but his disciples were baptizing more people than John's disciples were. And, and so Jesus once again become, comes to the attention of the Jewish leaders. And, and so Jesus withdraws still further. Uh, and he returns to Galilee as he goes uh, on, uh, we, we read in chapter 4, first of all, of his meeting on the journey with the woman of Samaria. Uh, and, and then we see that story of the, uh, the, the healing of the official's son. So Jesus by now has moved right away from Jerusalem. He's back in, in, in Galilee um, where uh, he grew up. And, uh, and so uh, he, he's out of sight, as it were, of the uh, religious leaders of the time. Uh, we're then told that Jesus returns to Jerusalem again. Uh, this is probably the following Passover, although it doesn't explicitly state that, but we think that's the most likely. Uh, so Jesus returns to Jerusalem probably for the next Passover, so 12 months later. And of course we have the account of the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. Again, Jesus' authority is questioned, and in particular, um, Jesus' authority is questioned uh, because he performed that miracle on the Sabbath day. And so when he told the man to pick up his mat and go home, uh, the, the religious leaders were offended uh, because Jesus had performed the miracle on uh, the Sabbath day, which they regarded as being against the law. And uh, we're told in uh, chapter 5 and verse 18 that the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus. And so we're at a stage in Jesus' ministry where the Jews, the Jewish leaders, are becoming uncomfortable with Jesus. Uh, and they're beginning to talk about the fact that he needs to be, he needs to be stopped. Uh, otherwise, he's going to bring the wrath of Rome down upon the people. Uh, after that particular um, uh, uh, story uh, in chapter 5, we come into chapter 6 where we're told that Jesus returns again to Galilee. So he removes himself once the feast is over, removes himself back to Galilee again um, where he's out of the way and, and out of the sight, the immediate sight of the uh, religious leaders in Jerusalem. So Jesus returns to Galilee. Uh, we have that account of the feeding of the 5,000. And again, we're told that the people want to make Jesus king. Uh, and Jesus, knowing that, he withdraws again uh, because he knows that it's not yet his time uh, for that to happen. That would be uh, contrary uh, to the purposes of God. And so uh, we have... Uh, Jesus walking on the water following the, 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 the feeding of the 5,000 and then we have that bread of life discourse that we have been looking at over a number of weeks. And now 
we come to this point. So what's been happening, you see, is that, that, that each time Jesus goes to Jerusalem, uh, it creates problems. Um, and those problems are, 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 are twofold. Um, sometimes the problem uh, is that the people want to make him king and, and of course that's not Jesus' purpose and sometimes it's the plotting of the Jews to prematurely end Jesus' life. And so we come into chapter 7 and uh, we're told here um, that uh, it's come round to the time for the Feast of Booze. The Feast of Booze um, uh, was, I suppose, essentially uh, like a harvest celebration. It was a, a celebration of the goodness of God to them uh, in providing for them. And, um, uh, and uh, as we uh, come to this passage, uh, we see that it's time for the Feast of Booths. Uh, we see this conversation between Jesus and his disciples uh, as, we, um, uh, as we read through this passage. Sorry, not between Jesus and his disciples, between Jesus and uh, his brothers. And his brothers have seen what's going on. Um, uh, Jesus, although he's withdrawn from Jerusalem and withdrawn from sort of being in the, uh, in the gaze of the religious leaders, has, of course, continued his ministry. We've seen, as we've already mentioned, the feeding of the 5,000. We've seen him walking on the water. We've seen that teaching and that discourse uh, about the bread of life. We've seen many of his disciples deserting Jesus. And, and so Jesus' brothers come to him and, and they, they encourage him um, to go up to the feast. And they're, they're saying to him, essentially, I mean, the argument basically is um, that uh, if Jesus wants to become known, if he wants to engage in this public ministry, there's no point doing that in the backwaters of Galilee. He needs to go to Jerusalem. Uh, there he needs to... Um, perform his miracles and perform his signs uh, and, 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 and build a following there. Of course, there's already something of a following for Jesus in Judea, and that's in part why Jesus had to withdraw. Um, it's not as though everybody there is against him. Uh, predominantly, it would seem to be the ruling elite who were against Jesus because he's rocking the boat. Um, but, but, but the disciples say, no, you, you need to, sorry, the, 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 the Jesus' brothers say, no, you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to be there um, because if you're going to build a following, if you want this public ministry, uh, you need to go where the people are, where the, where the, the, the movers and shakers are uh, within society. But of course, Jesus um, recognizes that they are not understanding God's purposes. They're not understanding God's plan. Uh, they're not following God's wisdom. Um, what we've got here is a, a case of human wisdom rather than divine wisdom. We've got uh, people following what seems to them to be a good idea uh, rather than seeing things as God sees them. They don't understand who Jesus is. We've already commented on that. They we're told they don't believe as yet. They don't understand really who Jesus is. They don't understand what his mission is. And, and so they're looking from a very human perspective and say, well, this, is the, this needs to be the next logical step, Jesus. They're not seeing things as God sees them. They're not understanding the mission that Jesus has here on earth. And so Jesus gets into this uh, discussion with them and he, he talks about the fact that his time has not yet come. Uh, he points out to them that your time is always here. Um, this is where the, the, the subtleties of the language begin to begin to come in, because at some point it, the, the language would suggest that we have a long-term view, uh, the plan of God for Jesus to die. At other points, we seem to have uh, more of a view of the immediacy uh, should Jesus go uh, to Jerusalem. And very often in Scripture, we see this where people are talking on one level and Jesus replies uh, using similar language, but actually shifting the conversation subtly, uh, but often and we lose that in the English translation. Um, but but, but the, uh, the brothers of Jesus want him to go. They want him to start to build that following um, in uh, Jerusalem and in Judea. Uh, but Jesus says, no, my time hasn't yet come. As I've already mentioned, Jesus sees two risks. One is of um, the people 
seeking to make him king. Now, of course, that would be dangerous uh, for a number of reasons. One is he didn't come to be king, not at least in the in, in the sense that they understood that. Uh, Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he comes uh, in his in the flesh in the on that first occasion. He comes not to take up uh, the ruler's position, but to become the priest and the sacrifice. And the people don't understand that. And, and so there's a risk that the people are going to try and take him and make him king. Uh, essentially, that they're going to preempt um, Palm Sunday, that they're going to make Jesus king. And of course, uh, a along with that goes all of the risks uh, of a Roman crackdown of the, the, the Jews opposing Jesus and these kinds of things. And, and Jesus knows that's not God's plan for him. It's not God's plan that he becomes ruler in Israel. But then there's also the matter of timing, the Jews wanting to kill Jesus. And Jesus knows that there's a risk that if he goes up at this point, uh, the Jews could arrest him and seek to have him killed. Uh, and you see, uh, that is not what God wants to happen. God's timing is very, very clear that Jesus is to, but to die at Passover um, not at the Feast of Booths. And, and so both of those risks would take Jesus outside of God's purpose, outside of God's plan, outside of God's will for him. Jesus essentially says to, to his brothers, look, you can go up to the feast. It doesn't matter when you go up to the feast, it's fine. You can go up to the feast, but I've got to follow God's plan. I've got to follow God's timing. I've got to do what God tells me to do. I'm not going up with you. Jesus isn't saying here he's not going to go to the feast. He's saying that the timing isn't right for him. And so Jesus brothers uh, go and they, they, they head off uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, one of the great feasts um, of the uh, Jewish calendar, uh, the Feast of Booths. They can go. They're not wrong in going. They can go. They not, haven't got the same restraint that Jesus has upon uh, him. But Jesus knows that he has to follow God's plan and God's purpose for him. And Jesus knows that the timing isn't quite right. It's not that he's not to go to the feast at all, but he shouldn't go right now. Because Jesus is listening to what God is saying to him. Jesus is, is, is following God's purpose and God's plan for him. He's not being derailed by popularity. He's not being knocked off track by threats and fear of threats. What's happening is he's staying very, very focused on God's purpose for him. Well, we know that Jesus goes up to the feast and partway through the feast, um, uh, he, he goes into the temple. But, but what we see first of all is that when Jesus first goes to Jerusalem, he does so privately. He does so um, uh, not with a fanfare, not drawing attention to himself. Uh, he does so just anonymously. He turns up at the feast. Uh, and what we find is that there is something of a hotbed of discussion, a hotbed of uh, rumour, uh, of, of, of conversation. All very hush-hush, all under, uh, under wraps uh, for fear of the Jewish leaders. But nonetheless, uh, a real discussion. Where is Jesus? What's he doing? Why isn't he here? Where is he? And uh, there's, the, there's this muttering, as it says in verse 12, uh, the people muttering under their breath, uh, muttering to one another what's going on. And of course, there's no real agreement about who Jesus is. Some people think he's a good man. Others think he's leading the people astray. Uh, but all are intrigued. All are looking. What's going on? Where is Jesus? Why isn't he here? And, and, and so we see that actually Jesus, uh, Jesus was, was spot on with not going at that early stage and going anonymously. Uh, the risk of the people uh, overreacting to him was very, very real. And, and, and that is seen uh, in this passage. But then partway through uh, the, 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 the festival, Jesus goes into the temple and this time he doesn't go into the temple to cleanse it. He doesn't go into the temple and start performing miracles and signs. He goes into the temple to start to teach. And we're told that the people were amazed at Jesus' teaching. Um, uh, in verse 15, we're told, The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning? 
when he's never studied? How is it that this man speaks with the authority that he does? Where did this wisdom come from? He's never studied under any of the rabbis. What possible explanation is there? They recognized that Jesus spoke with authority. They recognized that Jesus spoke truth. They recognized the, 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 the quality of Jesus' teaching. And yet they couldn't understand how any man could teach in that way when he hadn't studied for years under one of the great rabbis. And, and so they're confused. But Jesus continues teaching uh, and he redresses, he addresses um, their response to his healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. Now, obviously, some time has passed um, since then. Uh, Jesus has withdrawn following that and so on, uh, as we've already seen. But Jesus comes back to that theme and, and he tries to just settle things a little bit. And, and the first thing that he does is that he points out to them that they're guilty of double standards. Uh, they're guilty of double standards. But he starts off by, by challenging them about their reaction. Why are you trying to kill me? Why are you trying to kill me? Uh, and, of course, uh, the people react to that, and, and, and uh, some of them say, well, he's got a demon, no one's trying to kill him, what's he talking about? Uh, there's no one here trying to kill him. What, what on earth are you talking about, Jesus? But, of course, Jesus knows that that's the truth, not necessarily of every single person there. In fact, probably not of every single person there, but certainly of the people in power. Uh, that most definitely was their intention, and we've already seen that recorded uh, in John's Gospel on, on, on numerous occasions. Um, uh, but what Jesus does then is he, he takes them and he teaches them. He, he, he demonstrates to them that on the one hand, he is proving who he is by displays of power. But those aren't just random displays of power that ride roughshod over God's law. Y you see, they had a real problem because Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, look, there's a complete double standard going on here. To do that, to understand this, we need to just understand a little bit about the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was the day of rest. It was the seventh day uh, of the week. And in the law of Moses, it says that you are not to continue your ordinary work, your day-to-day -day work. Um, it's a day of rest. Now, the Jews, uh, and in particular, the, the, the rabbis and the leaders had sought to define what work meant. Of course, what God has said is just refrain from your normal work, take a day off and use that day um, uh, as partly as a day of rest, but also uh, very symbolic of the spiritual rest and all sorts of things going on. We're not going to do a study on the Sabbath uh, today. But that was, that was what was going on, and, uh, uh, and so the Jews had lots of rules and regulations about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. But there was another law in, in the law of Moses, and the, that law said that when a, a woman had a child on the eighth day, uh, she was to take him uh, and she was to offer sacrifice and to redeem him. Um, and uh, as uh, 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 the, the, the way that things worked in Jesus' day was if you had a child the day before the Sabbath, on the day of preparation, if a woman delivered a child um, on that day, it gave them a problem because the question was, should we uh, circumcise the child on the Sabbath or should we not? In other words, should we disobey the eight day rule or should we disobey the working on the Sabbath rule? And Jesus points out to them that these things aren't intended to be just absolutely rigid rules. That the, What they've done is they've made these things unworkable. They've built contradictions in because of their misunderstanding of the scripture. And Jesus points out that they would consistently and regularly break the Sabbath. The normal duty of the priest to whom the child was taken was involved uh, circumcising children. They'd be doing that on every day of the week. And yet, when it came to the Sabbath day, they didn't stop doing that. They didn't have a day of rest from their normal work. Uh, instead, they would uh, see uh, the eight-day rule as superseding the Sabbath rule. And Jesus comes and he says, look, what I'm doing is exactly the same as what you're doing. Out of 
obedience to God were seeking to do good. Um, in their case, they were, they were circumcising the child. In Jesus' case, he was healing a man who needed healing. Uh, and Jesus is saying, look, you, you, you're, you're judging me because I did this on the Sabbath. And yet, if you think through properly the principles of what you're doing, what you'll see is that I'm acting in the, in, in the same line of thought that you are using. I, I'm not overturning your rules. Um, it's just that you are blinkered to what is going on here. You're, you're refusing to see it. And, and, and he talks to them in this way. And, and, and of course, uh, Jesus uh, wraps up this passage in verse 24, uh, or John wraps up this passage in verse 24, but Jesus wraps up uh, this discourse by telling the people to judge not by appearances, but with right judgments. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with a right judgment, Jesus says to the people. Well, that's the passage such as we have it. Um, and, and, and what has this got to do with us? As, as you know, in this series, we're not looking to just build our historical knowledge of Jesus, his actions, his teachings, etc. What we're seeking to do is to say, what, what does it mean to live a mature Christian life? What are the lessons for us to learn here? And I think the major lesson that we need to learn here is that we need to see things as God sees them and that we need to act in accordance with God's purpose and plan and will for our lives. You see, I think the first challenge for us is this. Are we looking with a spiritual perspective or are we looking with an earthly perspective? Jesus' brothers were looking purely from a human perspective. Now, this becomes important for us both in our life together as a church and also in our individual lives. It's very easy for us to see ordinary everyday decisions or even big life decisions and to look at those from a, from a human perspective, from, a, from a, a temporary, temporal perspective. And what God wants us to do is to look at everything through spiritual eyes. You see, God puts us where he puts us for a purpose. God places in the time that he places us for a purpose. He wants, he, he wants, uh, wants something uh, to happen. He wants to use us in a particular way. Uh, he wants us to be a part of his plan and his purpose. And he places us specifically in that place, in that time. And he wants us to be there for his purposes. And if we're not looking at it from that perspective, if we're not looking at what does God want me to be doing in this time? What are the opportunities that he wants to be me to be taking? What are the service, what's the service that he wants me to offer? What are the gifts he's given that he wants me to use in this current context? Why has the Lord put me here? If we're not thinking about it from that perspective, if we're thinking purely from an earthly perspective, what we may find is that we go in a different direction to God's purposes. Or we might find, might find, as in this case, that we run ahead of God's purposes. We get ahead of ourselves and we start doing things too quickly when God wants us to be patient and to wait. Or maybe we go too slowly. But the point is this, we need to be listening to God. We need to understand what his purpose and his plan is and we need to be acting in accordance with that. Sometimes what that means, and I've already hinted at this in what I was saying a moment ago, sometimes what we need is just to be patient. Very often we go charging in. Um, there's that old phrase, isn't there? Charging in where angels fear to tread. And, and we need to just wait for God's time. You remember that account in the Old Testament uh, as God has brought his people out of, out of, out of Egypt and they're following him around in the wilderness. There's the pillar of fire by night. There's the pillar of cloud by day. And what we're told is if the pillar didn't move, the people stayed. And if the pillar stayed still for a long time, the people stayed for a long time. And when the pillar moved, they moved. They didn't run ahead. They didn't fall behind. They just followed where God was leading. And that's something that we, as the Lord's people, need to learn for ourselves. Are we willing to wait? Are we willing to be patient? Are we willing to wait for God's timing in situations? Are we willing to submit to God's will and God's purpose and God's ways?
Are we willing, as, it, as Jesus did, to, uh, to, to wait, not to go to the feast with everybody else, but to go at a different time? Are we willing to go quietly, anonymously, as Jesus did? You, you know, what is it that God wants for us? Are we, are we trying to turn around God's plans? Maybe the Lord wants us to take a bold step of faith, and we don't want to take a bold step of faith. We just want to be anonymous. And so we just hold back. Or, or, or maybe we do want to be visible. We do want to be seen as being the people who are doing and who are achieving and what have you. And God says, no, I want you to take a quieter, a more subtle approach. I want you to, to work in the background here. I want you to wait. Maybe we feel that God should do something a particular way. And yet he's not addressing it that way. Maybe there's, a, there's a, a, a wrong that needs to be righted and we're impatient to see it's righted. Maybe there's a difficult circumstance that we want to see removed. And yet God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taking that away, just as he did with the Apostle Paul, with his thorn in the flesh. All sorts of different things, but are we willing to submit to God's purposes and God's ways? Because God will always have a purpose. He will always have a plan. And uh, are, are we willing to submit to that? But of course, underlying this, there's a, there's a deeper application for us. Because if we're going to do those things, if we're going to look at things with spiritual eyes, if we're going to be patient for God's timing, if we're going to submit to God's will and his purposes and his ways, we need to learn to take time to listen to God's voice. A few times over the last few weeks, I've, I've ended up talking about meditation. And meditation is, is perhaps a, um, a, a, a practice that many of us have, ha, have not developed. Uh, and I know in my own life, uh, the practice of meditation has, has been something that has been a real blessing on many, many occasions. Just lingering on God's word, taking time prayerfully and quietly to mull over and to allow God to speak through his word. Not rushing on from one verse to the next, from one passage to the next, from one book to the next. But taking time, allowing the word to soak into our souls and prayerfully uh, allowing God to shape us. And if we're going to be able to do this, what we do need to do is to attune ourselves to God's voice. You remember that time where Jesus talking about those who are his, recognizing his voice. And he said that his sheep know his voice. Uh, that's what he said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Do we recognize the voice of God? There's only one way to do that and that's to spend time in his presence. It's to spend time in prayer. It's to spend time allowing him, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to shape us. There's no quick route to this. There is no such thing as instant maturity. We have instant coffee, we have instant meals, we have instant all sorts of things, but there is no such thing as instant maturity. If we're going to truly grow to maturity, if we're going to be Christians who are following what God wants and hearing what God is saying, we need to grow to maturity. We need to spend time in his presence, listening to what he is saying to us. We need to learn to recognize his voice. Samuel, the young Samuel, you remember that story? He's there in the temple and God speaks. And he hears the words, but he doesn't recognize that it's God. He thinks it's Eli. Uh, and it's only after those uh, two occasions that Eli realizes what's going on and he says, okay, next time, uh, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is, is, is listening. Uh, and of course, the Lord speaks. You see, we need to, to, to be people who attune ourselves to what God is saying. We need to be people who look at the world from God's perspective. We need to be those who are attuned in who are able to recognize the Lord's voice, who are willing to be patient and to do things in the Lord's timing, who are willing to submit and do things the Lord's ways. If we're going to grow to maturity, this is what we need. We need to be people who don't judge by appearances, but judge with a right judgment. We need to be people who believe 
what God says. We need to be people who recognize when the Lord is speaking are in, and are in touch with him, just as the Lord Jesus was. And indeed, uh, just as many of his followers were. You remember the Apostle Paul talked on occasions about he had a plan to do such and such, but the Lord prevented. We need to be people who listen to what God is saying, who learn to recognize his voice, and who then submit and obey him. So that's my takeaway for us for today. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. We're going to just close in a, a, a time of worship and then I'm going to pray to close our time together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Take 
pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are a God who speaks. We want to thank you that you are a God who has a purpose and a plan for our lives. Lord, we want to listen to you. Lord, we want to understand things from your perspective. Lord, we don't want to be people who run ahead of you. We don't want to be people who lag behind. Lord, we recognize that your ways are are perfect, that your plans are just, that your ways are true, and that your plans for us are for our good and for our blessing uh, in the in the big scheme of things. And, and so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us, Lord, when we don't look with a heavenly perspective, those times when we look with a, a very worldly perspective, those times when we don't look to what will honor you and will glorify you, but we look to ourselves and to what will satisfy us and and lord we thank you that you are a god who gives us many many good things but lord we don't want ever ever want to presume upon that we want lord rather to be those who listen to your voice who follow your paths who act in your time and who are willing to sit back and wait when you say sit back and wait. Help us to be wise. Help us to see with right vision, we pray. And help us to act in a way that is consistent with your plans, that is obedient to your call on our lives, and that seeks your glory. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.